Hello everyone, my name is Jay Kim and I'm an assistant moderator for the Oregon Surf Perch Fishing Club on Facebook. Welcome to part two of my two-part video series for beginners who want to learn how to surf perch fish on the Oregon coast. The first video is very important to watch, so please watch that before watching this one. As a reminder, this two-part series is for very beginning surf perch anglers. So if you've been out a few times, these videos aren't going to help you very much. These two videos only cover the basic fundamentals of surf perch fishing and glosses over many details. So if you want to learn more, there are many resources available. This is like learning ABCs before learning words like cat and dog. I'm just trying to teach you the alphabet. Here are my disclaimers. These are my own opinions and I'm not an expert, so you need to make your own decisions. There is no one right way to fish or catch fish. I fish about 60 times a year, so my learning is mainly based at one beach that I go to. These videos are summaries of what I've learned by watching a ton of YouTube videos and my personal experiences fishing with many anglers on the Oregon coast. And remember that you're responsible for your own safety and adherence to state laws and regulations. Don't blame others for your failure to do a proper fact checking. So in this video, we'll talk about how to catch surf perch. I'll go over rods and reels, talk about tackle, the line, hooks, weights, and kind of leaders that you can use. Talk about the different kinds of bait that are available and give you some miscellaneous tips. So for rods and reels, there's really no perfect setup. Just about any steelhead or salmon setup will work. Spinning rods are recommended because they're most easy to cast, but lots of people use bait casters and some people do fly fish in the surf. But for fly fishing, I would recommend that this is only done by seasoned anglers. So most anglers use the open face spinning setups. The recommended rod length is about eight to 12 foot. Uh, there's no, again, mo no one perfect rod. And this is rated for normally one to three ounces of weight and 15 to 30 pound mono line. Many brands are available, so shop around. Take into account your budget, the warranty the manufacturer offers, and how many times you're going to use it. If you're only going once a year, uh, you probably don't want to spend a lot of money. I would suggest using an open face spinning reel rated at 3,000 to 4,500 spool rating. Uh, this will give you enough line to cast out, but not cause you to have excess line that you'll never use. Again, many brands available. The prices range from $15 to over 500, and you can actually get reels for 1,500 or $2,000. So it just depends on your budget and again, how much you can afford. So there's two types of line that are used, monofilament and braid, although some do use fluorocarbon leaders. Most anglers will use braid as their main line because it's thinner and they will then use mono or fluorocarbon as the leader line. So most people will use 15 to 30 pound braid as their main line and then tie it to a 12 to 30 pound mono leader. There's many knots to use for braid to mono connection, so you know, do some homework on YouTube. Bottom line, budget is the biggest factor, but just about any setup will catch fish when they're biting. Casting distance, rod sensitivity, and comfort are the main aspects of a good setup. So I'll talk about line hooks and weights here. As I was saying before, most people use braid line as their main line and monofilament for leader line. Braid is much stronger at the same diameter as mono and has less line memory, so there's less coiling effect than mono. This coiling effect can cut down in your casting distance, so many people use braid for that reason. The other thing about braid is that it stretches less, so people believe that you can feel the fish bite easier than mono. There are many types of braid you can get braid with three strands to eight strands, depending on brand and what pound line strength you're looking for. But mono is less easy to see, so it scares fish less. So that's the reason why anglers use it for the leader line, because they believe that fish are line shy. The other thing about using a mono leader is if you get a snag, you only lose your leader, not a bunch of line. This pollutes the ocean much less and you don't end up losing 
all your casting line. So here's an example of the diameter. If you look at the red circles, you can see 20 pound braid is 0 0.009 inches thick. If you look at mono, a 20 pound mono is 0 0.016 inches thick. So you can see it's almost double the diameter of braid. So you can see that braid comes in many, many colors and it's really up to you what color you want. Uh, I use dark green because I think it's easy to see. I've tried orange and I've tried a couple other colors and it's just personal preference of what you want. There are hundreds of types of hooks on the market. So I'm just going to talk about the main ones that are used on the Oregon coast for surf perch fishing. Most anglers will use bait holders, circle or octopus hooks. The size will depend on what your preferences are, but generally people use number eight hooks to two aught hooks when they surf perch fish. There's really too many variables to cover in this video. So this is just an overview. So here are the three type of hooks that most people use. And the first thing you should notice is the difference in the eye at the top of the hook. You can see the bait holder is curved inward. The circle hook has a straight eye and the octopus is bent outwards. So many people use bait holder hooks because it has a long shank and the shank has two barbs on it. So this helps keep bait on your hook longer. And if the fish try and pull it off, you have the barbs to try and hold the bait. You'll notice that the hook point is straight up and it has a J bend. So these are a little bit easier for the fish to swallow. So you will gut hook fish more often than using the other two types of hooks. If you look at the circle hook, the biggest difference you can see is that the hook point is bent towards inwards, towards the shank. And there's no barbs on the shank as well. So this causes baits to slip off a little bit easier. This hook is designed to lip hook fish and it's more of a self hooking fish. So you don't have to jerk on the rod to set the hook. So this is the kind that I use because you lip hook fish more. They're more apt to survive when you release the fish. Then the last hook is an octopus hook. And you can see that it looks very much like a circle hook, except the hook point is straight like a bait holder hook. So this is another hook that is self hooking. And that's again, why many people use it. And many anglers also like because of the way the eye has been at the top that it lays against the line a little bit easier. So just like hook, there are a ton of different weights out there that you can buy on the open market. But the two most used weights on the Oregon coast are disc and claw weights, which are the first two weights you see on the left. So it's easy to understand why these are called disc weights because they just look like discs. So they're designed to be aerodynamically wind resistant, so they cast a lot easier, but they drift a little bit easy because they sit on the ocean floor and there's nothing to anchor them when the currents are drifting. So that's why claw weights are another popular type of weight on the Oregon coast because it has two claws that anchor the weight into the sand so it helps control the drift. So it drifts much slower. The next type of weight is a pyramid weight and it looks exactly like a pyramid, upside down pyramid and the point digs into the sand. So again, it helps slow the drift when the currents are strong. The next two type of weights actually have legs and a spider weight has wire weights attached to the lead and what you do is you twist the wires and you spread them out uh, at like an anchor. So the legs are removable. So you have to bend them every time that you cast these out. So this actually cuts down on the drift very significantly compared to the other three weights I just talked about. So this is the weight I use the most. The last weight is a Sputnik weight and it's called a Sputnik because it looks exactly like the first satellite ever launched into space, which is the picture you see in the top above Sputnik. But these legs actually are movable, which is when you cast them out, they actually will expand out. And then as you reel it in, they collapse back in. So 
These are very uh, exclusive weights. They're very expensive. And again, they hold your wig, rig down very stationary. So it just very little. So in terms of leader rigs, it's all personal preference. But the most popular rig used on the Oregon coast is a high-low rig with either two to three hooks. The weight is below the hook, so it's easy to cast with two to three hooks. And using two to three hooks allows you to use different types of bait on each hook. The fish can feel resistance, though, due to the small line lengths. And when fish feel resistance, a lot of times they'll drop the bait and then you don't get a hook up. So you can get high-low rigs by buying them or you can tie your own. There's many different ways to tie high-low rigs, so do your homework on YouTube. So here's two pictures of what a high-low rig looks like. But you can see that the weight is on the very bottom. There's about a one and a half to two foot gap between the weight and the first very bottom hook. And then hooks are spaced between 10 to 12 inches each. So the easiest way is to use a dropper loop for the hooks. But again, there's many different ways to tie your hooks to a high-low rig. So again, look it up on YouTube. The other most popular rig is called the Carolina rig. And this rig is actually used for many different types of fishing. But the biggest difference is, is that the weight is above the hook and it's a sliding sinker versus being a stationary weight like the high-low rig. So the big advantage of this rig is that when fish bite on the bait, they don't feel resistance or less resistance because the weight is sliding and so when the fish starts biting the hook and pulls, the weight will slide and there's less resistance for the fish. So they're more likely to keep the bait and hook in their mouth longer and your chances for a hookup are greater. But in this rig, it's harder to cast with multiple hooks. And so you give up the advantage of using different baits and multiple hooks to use this rig. The other types of rigs are a sabiki rig, bobber setup, fish finder rig, and fly fishing rigs. But again, this is very complicated. So do your homework on YouTube if you want to find out more about these types of rigs. So in my experience, real bait is more successful in catching fish than any other kind of bait. But the big disadvantage is, is that you need to rebait often because real bait is often soft. Fish can peck at it easily. And with the casting force that you put onto it, you often lose it. So many anglers will use elastic thread to keep real bait on the hook. The most popular and the most effective bait in my opinion is sand shrimp, or some people call it ghost shrimp, but there are several different terms. So the way you can tell the Oregon sand shrimp is on the upper left-hand corner of the pictures. You can see that one claw is much bigger than the other claw. So this is a typical Oregon sand shrimp. You can buy these, but many anglers pump their own at lower tides. Another popular bait is molar sand crabs because you can dig these up on the beach using your tool or hands and this is a very popular surf perch bait because it's a natural food for them the third most popular bait are clams and mussels and you can either buy these but most again dig their own and then we'll freeze the clam necks and then thaw them out when they're bait fishing so again this is another effective bait for perch catching and many anglers use this on the surf because it's easy to freeze and carry with you. You can also get store bought shrimp, uh, store bought clams and store worms. So it's really up to you what kind of real bait you use. But if you use real bait, your chances of catching are much better than using artificial baits. So after real bait, the next most popular bait on the Oregon coast are plastic baits because they are less messy and they last a lot longer. So you don't have to rebait as often. But if you're going to use plastics, please use biodegradable products. The most popular plastic bait on the Oregon coast are gulp sandworms. They come scented. They're in different colors. They're in 
different sizes and the two inch are the most popular. And again, they're biodegradable. But there's an endless array of worms and shrimp and bait fish and paddle tails that you can buy. So it's just up to you what you want to buy. So in the upper left hand corner of the pictures, you can see that the gulp sandworms come in camo, natural, bloody, and they come in many other different colors, but these are the three most popular colors on the coast. You can also get plastic sand crabs. I haven't been as successful, but you know, you never know. And in the bottom left hand corner, you can see that they offer saltwater ghost shrimp and they call these ghost shrimp versus sand shrimp. But you can see that one claw is bigger than the other. And so this is more representative of the sand shrimp on the Oregon coast. And in the bottom right hand corner, Again, there's other many kind of different plastic baits you can use that are paddle tail and swim baits. And again, many people have caught on these baits. It's just what your personal preference is. So besides real bait and plastic baits, there are crank baits and flies. There are bait fish diving lures like the Khaleesi that you see here. It looks like a small bait fish and you can see the lip in the front helps it dive. There are various types of diving lures and they go different depths. The other thing that people use will use flies, but being successful at fly fishing requires a high level of expertise. So I wouldn't recommend this for beginners. If you're thinking about scents, this is all personal preference, but from my experience, this is used for artificial baits only and many people don't use this at all. So bottom line, uh, these two types of lures and scents are not used, but it's all personal preference again. So once you have all the essential gear, you probably want to look at some miscellaneous gear that will help you fish. So for waders, there's really two types, and these can go anywhere from $40 to $3,500. You know, again, depending on what your budget is, you want to think about what kind you want. So the two types are there's waders with boots that are part of the waders and then there's stocking waders. And don't forget, no matter which waiter you get, you need to wear your waist belt always. So the advantages of having a booted waiter is that there's no cracks or seams for sand to get in your boots as you wade around. It's a one step to get outfitted, which is in other words, you know, once you slip your feet into these waders, then you're done. For Stocking waders, you need to find footwear. So you can change boots for different fishing. So again, if you're like a steelhead fishing or river fishing, then these are ideal waders because then you can change boots depending on what type of fishing you're going for. It's also easier to find fits because you don't have to worry about shoe size. You just have to worry about stocking size. And it's easier to find more comfortable footwear using these because you can choose whatever foot you, footwear you want. I know a lot of people who actually use Crocs when they're using these types of waders. So there are things to consider, which is, you know, your budget. So is it easy to repair or replace? In other words, if you puncture it and it starts developing a leak and you can't fix it, you know, can you replace it right away? So I would also try on waders before purchasing because fits are very e iffy and you want to try them before you buy them. The other thing is that if you buy neoprene waders, they're very warm, but they're really heavy. So I actually bought a pair and then returned them right away because it was just too heavy for me. So footwear can be cheap, like I said, like Crocs. But again, you can get expensive boots if you want. And it just depends on what's most comfortable for you. So the stocking waders allow different kind of boots, as I said, and you can use these waders for different types of fishing. Also look for pockets and ways to carry things around. My waders actually have a front pocket and they actually have a place for a cell phone. So again, it's just easier for the angler to have places to put stuff when they're fishing in the surf. So the next piece of gear you might wanna look at is how you store your catch. And these are really the two most popular ways, which is anglers like to store their fish on ice because it keeps them fresher. And many other people like to use a fish catch bag because it allows them to be more mobile on the beach. So the disadvantage of storing your fish on ice is that whether you use an ice chest or a bucket, 
You have to keep carrying it if you move when you fish. You also have to bring a cover to prevent seagull theft because the birds are very aggressive and they will take fish from you if you're not watching it. So most anglers will use a fish catch bag because as you surf perch fish, you will find that you'll be moving a lot and you don't really want to get out of the water to put your fish away and move your bucket or your ice chest. So this allows you to be very mobile and it also has mesh which allows the fish to bleed into the water. But no matter which way you store your catch, you want to bleed your fish immediately and here's the reason why. If you look at this picture, the fillet on the left was a fish that was not bled. So you can see how much the blood seeped into the flesh and it doesn't look as firm and white as the one on the right, which was bled immediately. So here's the recommended way to bleed your fish, which is you want to dispatch the fish instantly so there's no pain involved. I typically use a scissors point and pierce the brain and then cut the gills and wash in the water. And then I store it in my fish catch bag. So again, this is what I would recommend you do immediately whenever you catch a fish and you want to keep it to eat. So the last piece of gear I'm going to talk about are ways to carry your things that you need to take with you. So many people will carry an extra rod and reel if they can't get back to their car. So they have an immediate way to keep fishing if their first rod and reel fail. But at a minimum, you should carry extra rigs, bait, weights, and lures, and also a crab gauge in case you get lucky with the Dungeness. Also think about a way to carry your food, water, personal medication, and a device to call 911. And don't forget that sometimes phone coverage is very spotty on the beach, so you might want to think about buying a marine VHF radio like I just did. Also, you also might want to think about carrying a first aid kit and things like sunscreen. You can also carry extra rain gear, hats, and clothes in case the weather changes. Uh, I always carry a rain hat and rain gear in my backpack just in case it starts raining. The other thing I do is I carry my GoPro and a camera equipment, so think about a way to carry those. So the easiest way to carry everything, if you've got a lot of stuff, is to use a wagon with sand wheels. Don't buy a wagon with very thin wheels as it's very hard to maneuver through the beach if it's very thin wheels. Because I only go for like two hours max, I use a fishing tackle backpack and I don't carry food or water with me, so I mainly carry just extra rigs with me and clothing. The other thing you can do is if you're a real bait user, is find a waist belt that you can carry rigs and carry your bait in so it's very easy to have access to those things. So again, just think about different ways to carry the things that you need to bring and everyone needs to bring different things because everyone has different needs. So here's some final fishing tips. Bring extra gear whenever possible and especially pre-tied rigs so there's less downtime. This will save you a lot of time if your first rig fails and try and use a checklist so you don't forget things. If you're driving over two hours and your rod and reel fail, it's going to be miserable if you can't fish, so bring an extra rod and reel if you can. And if it takes you 30 minutes to re-rig, again, that's a lot of time if you're driving two hours. The other thing is always rinse your gear off with fresh water as soon as you can because salt water is corrosive. The sooner you can rinse off your gear, the longer it will last. If you're not having any action, keep moving and you got to find the fish. I usually move about 25 feet if I get no action after two casts. Remember that 90% of the fish are in 10% of the water and you got to go find that 10% of the water. So go up and down the beach as well as cast far and sometimes they're close by. So we just got to keep finding them. So I usually cast as far as I can. Then I let it sit for about 10 seconds and then reel in about five feet and let it sit again. I keep doing this until I have to recast. I also try and read the swells in the beach a lot. And 
you got to watch a lot of YouTube videos or go with the teacher who can show you the uh, ropes. But I look for concurrent crashing waves that are dark green. And perch tend to gather in certain areas. So if you find one, generally you'll find a few. So all beaches have contours that change daily and weekly. So don't expect predictability. In other words, if you caught a fish one day, doesn't mean you'll find the fish the same place up next week. And I would tell you that, you know, focus on enjoying the experience versus catching the fish. There's nothing like connecting with Mother Nature. So here's some resources to help you learn before you go out. Join the Oregon Surf Perch Fishing Club on Facebook and ask any members to fish with you, where to fish, and for any advice. You'll often get members to help you go out the first time you go. You can also watch YouTube videos from a YouTuber called PKE who, won, who runs the Oregon Life channel and he is well known throughout the Oregon community. The other thing you can do is wherever you go, ask the local tackle and bait shops for help as they will give you lots of advice. So that's the end of video two and here's a summary of both videos. Remember to always be legal and safe in surf fishing and safety is number one after being legal. Learn to read surf forecast to determine how safe and comfortable it will be by using different apps. Know all regulations and laws as they change frequently, so make sure you go to the ODFW website and always carry the proper licenses and tags. Learn about marine protected areas and know saltwater gear restrictions versus freshwater. Also know about species harvesting limits and restrictions. Please sustain the environment. Don't litter. Use biodegradable plastics and harvest responsibly. And remember, just about any gear will work, so you don't need to spend a lot of money just to surf fish. Real bait works best, but artificial bait is easier to use. I would suggest you always bring extra gear and necessities and find a way to carry them as easily as you can, as well as finding a way to store your catch. Learn to read the beach and wave action and keep moving to find the fish. It's a continual learning process and these videos only cover the very basics. So you're going to end up spending a lot more time learning about the subtleties and nuances of how to catch perch in the Oregon surf. So thanks for watching these videos and I hope these videos were helpful to you.